Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Erica. How are you today? Hi, I'm doing great. Thank you. How are you? Oh, thank you for asking. Yeah, I'm doing really well. I'm in the United Kingdom and we are having a very uh, surprising warm autumn right now. Like yesterday, uh, I'll do it in centigrade. It was like 19, nearly 20 degrees centigrade in -hmm. October. I mean, it's unheard of. So this climate change business is really, (laughs) it's really going on here. Yeah. Uh, Actually, I have to say we have a similar temperature today. It was 17 degrees and I was like, what? That's warm too. Yeah, it's warm. And uh, like first of September was like the really cold and it was cold until now. And I was like 16 degrees and I'm like, wow, this is actually warm. Yeah, the sun is shining Mm -hmm. and yeah, it's great. I love it. I love it. But Mm -hmm. it's also worrying. (laughs) You know, you kind of go, oh, this could be climate change and all of this business anyway. Or it can get very cold very quickly. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. I mean. I mean, you don't know, do you? You just don't know mm-hmm. anymore. We have mild winters. We have rainy summers, dry summers. I mean, it's just all over the place. I, agree. I mean, the seasons are just kind of kind of getting mm-hmm. into one big season, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I do know. I agree with you, actually, in this one. The, the weather is changing unpredictably these days. Yeah. So, Erica, um, thank you for coming on the Share Your Story podcast. This is all mm-hmm. about your story. So my opening question to you is going to be, um, tell us your story and how you got to where you are today. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a very um, open-ended question and definitely um, I can speak a lot about it. Um, But just to summarize, I actually grew up in a very small village, not even a town. I grew up in a very small village on the west side of Lithuania by the sea. Um, And from the very early days, I mean, I thought I'm going to be a doctor. I'm not kidding. I really thought I'm going to be a doctor. I studied hard. I was prepared to be a doctor. And after I finished school, I actually got into the medical school. But at the same time, I had a big desire to leave uh, Lithuania and go abroad. So at the same time, I had two different options. One was go to the capital of Lithuania and study medicine, which I got into free. Like I got like the, the, what is it, scholarship, right? Um, yes. ev- like everything paid off and I just needed to go. Um, but I also had an offer from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland because I was considering going to the UK. Okay. And I made that choice and I decided to go to the UK and I studied neuroscience. So as a foreign person, it was very hard to get into medicine there. So I was like, I'm going to do something similar, which is, I mean, this is science. I did neuroscience. Yes. Um, but at the same time, I was like, this is something I'm going to try and see if I want to kind of make a change later on and go back into medicine in the UK. Mm. So, yeah, so I graduated. I have to say those four years were not the most exciting years for me because I clearly knew I'm in the wrong place. Um, but I have um, I'm a big achiever. That's what I call myself. And if I decide to do something, I'm going to finish it. And maybe right. then I'm going to be like, well, I could have finished sooner or I could have just quit, but I don't quit. So so I finished university, but um, at the end of my fourth year, I knew that I actually want to go and work with people. So I went into project management. I'm really good, I think, with people, good at planning, good at organizing. And I went in a pharmaceutical company. Okay, um, can I can I hold you? Can I mm-hmm. interject and ask a question? Yeah. Because going from kind of medical school then going into neuroscience mm-hmm. um which is which is you know di- very different to kind of medical school becoming yeah. a doctor yeah what and although you said it wasn't the best fun time there mm-hmm. was it the the country was it the people was it the studying what what was it that did, wasn't great about it mm. It's a very good question, to be honest. Um, I think it's a combination of a lot of things. I'm not saying anything bad about the country. I think Scotland is great. Um, mm. I mean, it's, it's great. But I think, you know, when you are 19 and you leave your country, you leave your parents, your friends, and you go to a new country, 
it's a challenging journey on its own. And no matter what fantastic country you land in, you're going to feel like you are you don't belong here. You've been kind of thrown away and you don't yes. even know how to adjust because it's, everything is new. I mean, when you become a student, things become new because you have to live on your own. And when you mm. do that in a foreign country, that's even harder. So it was really tough. Um, the experience wasn't pleasant probably because I knew I'm not doing the right thing. I like neuroscience and I still think it's a an interesting uh, field of um, science that I actually have passion for, but it's not yes. something that I would love to specialize in and do and basically dedicate my whole life for. Um, so yeah, so it was interesting, but at the same time, I was like, this is definitely not what I want to do. I need people. I need you know solve problems i don't want to understand why things happen i actually want to to solve the problems and move on so this is okay. where you know it clashed with also my personality and how i like to approach situations uh but yeah scotland is great university was great everything was great it just i knew i was not in the right place right so if you were to look back now mm -hmm. so how many years ago was that um, um that was like i got into university so that's 10 years ago okay 10 years ago so mm -hmm. looking back now looking back on those 10 years and studying the studying that you did in the, the neuroscience because mm -hmm. i mean neuroscience is yeah i think more people need to be aware of neuroscience i think because I agree there is a lot about the brain we still don't understand, but there is mm -hmm. a lot that has been researched that we do understand. Mm -hmm. And if we had more clarity about what our brain does, we, you know, we, I think we'd all be able to live better lives, yeah. um, having a better appreciation of what goes on in there. Yeah. So, um, so some, some stuff you learned, right. Mm -hmm. When you did that, you had to get your degree done. So did you, looking back at it now, has it helped you in your journey after that? Or if you look back on it now and go, yeah, that really was worthwhile in the end because mm. I can apply some of that in my work today. Yeah, to be honest, it's very, it's, it's very hard to answer because I don't think I, I carry specific knowledge that I got from there. I mean, one thing that I know I got from university is the awareness there's a memory type that's called spatial memory and i don't have that developed properly in my brain because i can never navigate properly in streets and i will never remember like where is what street so that doesn't work in my brain and that's thanks to neuroscience but apart mm. from that you know as i said i think this is going back to my first point going abroad studying in a university in a country that you never visited before gives yes. you a big challenge and overcoming that challenge gives you priceless lessons and yes. you know yeah, it's, it's, it was a big challenge and I'm happy I overcame it. And not only I graduated from university with a, a good grade, but I also during this whole time I worked, I had multiple different jobs and I worked at nights and I worked like 70 hours a week. Like I knew, it, you know, it was more expensive country than, than Lithuania is. Uh, my parents, you know, had struggled to, to, to help me out. So I knew I had to work mm. all of that time management problem solving kind of survival mode that I had to turn on it's 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 something that I mean I think a lot of people don't have this opportunity to get no. it so 100%. I appreciate yeah 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 and I yeah I just wanted to add and I appreciate everything that I have now because of how hard I knew I had to work and how hard I worked so it gave me you know those those great lessons that are that's something that you don't learn in books something you get with practice I I love that you mentioned that and I think that is invaluable. You know, going abroad is invaluable. I, w I lived abroad at a very young age. Mm -hmm. And I think what it what it prepares you for is being able to be resilient with change in yeah. your life. You know, mm -hmm. if there is change in your life for whatever reason, you're able to be more resilient because mm -hmm. you've experienced change at a young age and coped you know you survived it yeah <laughs> and, I did. Mm -hmm. well it not just survived you thrived uh mm -hmm. during that change and therefore that gives you a certain amount of resilience anyway sorry i interrupted you but i i think we i wanted to reflect with you on your time there yeah. and how that 
you know benefited you so okay yeah no it's it's great actually that you asked I definitely reflect on that in my own time as well and I appreciate that time that I had lots of great lessons maybe this is also something that made me who I am today I'm always yes. after a challenge I'm always after a change and I know that you know if I um settle with the status quo um that's it I'm not moving forward so yes. definitely th that time gave me um this experience which helps me um these days so yeah so after university I, then I went to uh, work as a project uh, manager in a pharmaceutical company and I think one year in I decided that it's getting harder to be in a foreign country all alone and now that university doesn't hold me there and I got a bit of international experience maybe it's time for me to come back yeah and it's actually funny to say but my decisions usually come on spot and I execute fast especially when I know deep in my heart that this is the right move so the decision was made literally one morning I was sipping coffee before we started work with my colleague who's now also my business partner at this um right this moment we we're sipping the coffee and I was like I think actually I want to go back home. And that morning I bought tickets like for two months, um, two months after to go back to Lithuania. Right. Um, again, this is me seeking for a challenge and seeking for a change. Yes. So I went back. It was really hard, I have to say, because neuroscience or pharmaceutical industry or however you want to call it is not really that developed in Lithuania. And it's not popular. Lithuania is not the place to, you know, produce uh, drugs or um, do something that's that's to do with biology so it's not the ideal place uh, and I knew I don't want to work in a lab so it was really challenging for I think three months I was like trying to find a job um, because I didn't want to do just any job I wanted to do a job that I really like so three months it was hard because I'm a hard working person I don't like to sit still um, so I think this is the period where I had to go through a lot of emotional things in my brain like accept the fact that Right now, I have to be patient. I have to look for a job. I have to, you know, consider different options. It's so funny. I even had an offer. Like immediately, I came back and I got an offer from a from a pharmaceutical company in London. And I told you I'm a big achiever, so I felt responsibility to go there. And I flew there, and I felt like someone is someone is literally throwing me in the water, and I don't know how to swim. I went to the airport. Uh, I arrived in London and I decided that I want, don't want to go. So I waited overnight and I went back home. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is like, this is when I knew I'm not doing the right thing. And it was so strong in me that I was like, why did I even fly here? I know yeah. I'm not doing the right thing. So literally, I just sat in the airport all night. I am, well, first thing I called my mom, I was like, mom, I think I'm coming back. I don't feel like I'm doing the right thing. And she was like, okay, come back. She actually, of course, got very happy because she knew I'm not leaving again yes so yeah and then I came back and actually that night when I decided that I'm not going to that interview I got an offer from a company in Lithuania to be a project manager in a biotechnology company right so it kind of worked out well and this is where I knew that my intuition or whatever it's called or sixth sense or whatever sense it is led me to the right place and yeah I came back and I got a job that is and there <laughs> <laughs> six months in I was like hmm, it's not for me like corporate doesn't work for me it's too slow I don't see my impact it's I mean it's a great it was a great company organized and this is what I think where I learned about the lean aspect how important it is to be extremely organized have processes in place have really strong people in the in the team um, but yeah, I wasn't very happy so then I was went on upwork this is where I learned that there's a thing called upwork Yes. And I found a job uh, being a personal assistant to an agency in the U.S. Right. So when you think about it, it was a very big change for me because I was a project manager leading extremely intelligent people on yes. really important projects that affect, you know, like loads of pharmaceutical companies out there producing, you know, cancer drugs. So I decided to go from having that position to being a personal assistant in a startup of four people. But it was right. a, a yeah, but it was something that I was like, oh, I feel like it's the right move. So I made that move. And two years later, I actually became the CEO of the company. What? I was running, mm -hmm, I was running the whole operations department department. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, yes. hold on, hold on. You're going too fast for me. Okay. You did warn me you would go fast. 
-hmm. right hold on a second let me ask a question mm -hmm. um yeah. when you joined upwork mm -hmm. right you're you have to kind of move did, did you do that while she was still in the biotech company i registered yes yeah you registered mm -hmm. right and you have to register as like a freelancer correct mm -hmm. yes yeah. so you became a freelancer on the side yeah and did you do the work concurrently so were you still doing work for the biotech and then started offering your i mean what what did you decide when you went on Upwork, what your services were going to be? Very good question. At that moment, think about me. So I have a neuroscience background. I have, let's say, a year and a half of experience in project management. I don't have any specific skills. Like, I no. don't know how to run ads. I don't know how to do marketing. I don't know how to, I don't know, code or anything like that. No. So I was like, I'm going to start from the bottom. I'm going to be an assistant because I know how to organize myself. I definitely know how to organize other people and help them get organized. So I just right. became an assistant. It wasn't like it happened, uh, like it was going on for a long time. Actually, just before um, I was offered the job, I already considered moving away from the corporate job. Uh, and I just, yeah, at some point I was like, okay, I'm just going to do my freelancing full time but it's still right. freelancing and I'm going to give up the job. Okay. So, yeah. So I become an assistant. But did you do <clears> that <throat> at the point that you became an assistant or did you just for a few weeks or months not get yeah. any work? No, 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 no. I actually got the job to be an assistant and then I quit yeah. the job. Okay. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And was <clears> it <throat> going to, did you feel because you know, even being an assistant, being a freelancer, it's not forever, right? It's only temporary normally. It's like yeah. short period of time, <clears throat> freelancing maybe for a few months. And so yeah. how did you feel about losing the income that you were getting a regular job? And then were you still living with your parents at this stage? No, I was living no. all the day alone. Like I was living alone since 19. So um, I only came back to my parents for three months when I came back to right. Lithuania. Right, um, right. No, actually, I mean, of course, whoever is listening and maybe is a freelancer or considering freelancing path, of course, don't make a mistake and go out the job, like leave your job to mm. look for opportunities. No, but I made an agreement with this agency, which, of course, is not extremely strong agreement because it was a startup of four people. Lots of things can go wrong. But yes. we made an agreement that I'm going to be working 35 hours a week. This is the rate and this is what I'm going to be getting. So when I left the corporate job, I know that I'm getting into this. I knew all of the risks, but I also knew that I'm young and I have the time to, to, to make all of the mistakes and try it. And it was tough, you know, like nobody understood around me why I'm doing this. My parents couldn't get it. They were like, you are so yeah. happy to get this job. And now I'm you're gonna... giving it up to be a personal assistant for a company that's not even probably In... fully established. So it's a massive risk because, risk. I mean, d did you do you know about the American? And no offense to America, but their culture is very much like hire and fire, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if you if your face doesn't fit after a few days or weeks, you could be out. So yeah, yeah, I know that I'm aware of that, but I also know that I'm an extremely hardworking person and I have very good work ethics. And now right. when I interview people and I see how people sometimes turn out to be, I know that I have a big advantage and it's a work ethic because, right, right. you know, I'm responsible. I'll do whatever it takes to get the job done. Of course, not in a bad way, but, you know, I'll get it done if I, <laughs> if, if I say I'll get it done. Uh, so I knew, I, you know, I was confident. And also I knew that I'm young. If something doesn't work out, I can always go back. I can always yes. go back and find another another job. Of, true. You have to be, That's yeah, true. You, yeah. Yes. And you have to be smart about it. Of course, I would not make a decision to just quit everything if I didn't have savings, if I didn't have it all planned out. I'm very conscious about things and I plan. And when I make a decision, it sounds like it's a risky decision, but I know that in my head, it's fully worked out. And I know if it doesn't work out, it's not the end of the world for me. So, yeah, so I had Very good, organized. very good. Okay, so you're now with this startup company, Mm -hmm. and you're doing your personal assistant work and and then all of a sudden you jump to CEO but can you give us some 
How yes. long was the time before that happened? Were you successful with them? Were they happy with your work? Yes. Well, clearly they were very happy. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I don't even know how long I was an assistant. Maybe like um, maybe like six months, seven months. Right. No longer than that. I uh, also forgot to mention the fact when I joined them, which was in January, I think of 2000, maybe 18, if I remember right, or 2000, yeah, 2018, I think, but I might be wrong with the dates. Um, we all decided to meet up in Guatemala. <laughs> Funny, right? Who goes to Guatemala? So we decided to meet up in Guatemala. Um, we then went to Mexico, Cuba, we traveled a little bit here and there. Um, I think I was doing a great job and very soon I became a project manager there. Right. Was smart. this for like team building, getting to know each other and stuff? Guatemala, yeah, it was more like workation where we actually got together yeah. to work together. Yeah. Because um, you yeah. could basically, with so is this a technology company type? Marketing agency. Okay. So basically they can work anywhere in the world, right? If you've exactly. got computer, internet, you can go yeah. anywhere. Right. Yeah, ex- exactly. Yeah. So we had this meetup there. Um, very soon I became a project manager because clearly I had the skills and that was something that the agency needed. And at that point, you know, was six months in a startup, small startup. So you know everything in and out, especially as an assistant, because you're close to every single responsibility in the organization. Um, after project management, I realized I really like to build processes. And this is, I think, thanks to the corporate job that the one I got in Lithuania, because that's where I learned about lean and the aspect, yeah, like being extremely lean. And I loved it. And I think in a startup, there's so much things you can develop to basically build this machine that can produce anything that you set your mind to. So, yeah, so I started becoming operations manager and very soon, you know, the company needed someone to lead the decision making on a high level. And I became a CEO. That but the, didn't they already have a CEO? No, they had a CEO and that was the, the founder of the company. Remember when I joined, it was four people. I was the fourth person on the team. Okay. So you became yeah. COO or CEO? C-O. No, C- COOO. Chief Operating Officer. Yes. Right. Exactly. Okay. Just to get rid of the acronyms. Yeah. So yeah. The, there was a chief mm-hmm. executive officer. You became chief operating officer. Yes, exactly. Fantastic. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That, that's a journey. <laughs> awesome. Were your parents proud? Um, To be <laughs> honest, it's hard to explain to my parents what I do, because all I do is sit at my, my computer all day long at home. So they don't really understand. I just, you know, I don't even share the, that information no. with them like i tell them oh, i became one of the leading people in the organization they of course are happy for me but yeah. at the end of the day they're not able to to, to describe what i'm doing they have no clue no nope. no <laughs> well but it is what it is um <laughs> yeah so coo and mm-hmm. then what happened after that this is this is now the current situation still no no, no. no the current situation okay we're not finished yet <laughs> no <laughs> no, we're not finished. So what happened after that is that um, at some point I realized, you know, there's so much knowledge that I have that could help startups that were in the situation we were. And I know I can help them. And of course, people um, were reaching out to me, especially in the marketing industry. You know, the word spreads around fast. Lots of agencies, but also uh, not that many great people around. So people started talking. So they started reaching out to me, asking for help to, I don't know, set up their Asana or um, build up certain process, you know, how to get creative uh, process in place or something like that. Um, And that's when I realized that I think it's time for me to consider opening up a side business where I start consulting people on on the topics that are of interest and in need. So I opened up Prasana. That's the company that I run at this moment. It was a side business. Uh, we had an agreement with the CEO of the agency that I worked at that I'm going to do it on the side because you know I do have the time and I want to develop my business. And I made it clear from the very beginning that my ultimate goal is to have my own business. Yes. Um, so yeah, I started doing that. And at some point, well, actually not at some point, when COVID hit, I met a person whom we decided to do a project together. And that project turned to be a different company. And the company was remote. Do you you understand remote and also COVID and remote? Yes. So yeah, yeah, so we opened up a company where we started helping uh, startups how to set up remote environment for their teams. 
Right. And I think we did that for maybe a year and a half. Uh, and then for internal reasons, we decided to split the, the ways. And I kind of, everything that we did, I brought back under Prasanna's name. And that's what right. I'm doing right now. So right now we help startups, primarily marketing agencies and e-commerce companies, um, build their teams and grow their teams. And that could be through processes, through recruit, recruitment, talent development, structure in the organization and so on. So this is what we do. Okay, so okay, I want to back up that tiny mm -hmm. little bit to just to clarify a few things for our listeners. Okay. So just just share with us. I think I know what it is, but just share what as first of all what Asana is. Yes, so Asana is a workload and workflow management system. It's a it's a tool that you can actually um, use in your organization that helps you plan the work, manage your workload, plan your tasks, projects, uh, processes as well. It's, I don't know uh, how familiar you are you are with all of the project management tools, but there are similar like Trello, Monday, ClickUp, um, probably. I love I love Trello. I would say Trello is kind of the light version of these things. Yes, exactly. And uh, Trello is uh, owned by, what's the company? Mm, I don't know. Yeah, they're owned by a bigger company who have another software package. Hmm. to help for project flow like yeah so trello is like the light version and it's to mm -hmm. help yeah i i think it's like i don't know people call it kaiban they call it Kanban. all sorts of different mm -hmm. names in terms of managing projects you know you can have tasks and yeah. cards and you move the cards around you can have workflows you can mm -hmm. yeah it uh, i love them yeah i think they're brilliant they're brilliant i love asana so, not that big of a Trello fan, sorry, Trello, but That's Asana fine. is great. Yeah, I mean, it's whatever you're used to, and you mm. Asana is probably a bigger, better version of Trello. Yeah. But Okay, so you cleverly put the letters P-R-O, pro, in front of Asana, but without the A, and called yourself Prosana, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm, I don't know actually it was it is connected but it just somehow persona was <laughs> stuck with me okay. and uh, i mean at some point someone made me aware that this is very similar to asana and i was like yeah actually maybe it is similar it was it just i don't know somehow subconsciously you did mm -hmm. it yeah. oh, okay that's fine but what what it sounds like is like professional like a pro mm -hmm. you're a pro in asana basically that's what i kind of heard you know i'm the professional that knows how to work yeah all of these different software mm -hmm. um so when you said prosana i went that's quite clever because it kind of links to it a little bit but it's not linked to it it's a standalone word exactly um, made up word mm -hmm. okay so so let's let's just unpack if you wouldn't mind mm -hmm. in a little bit more detail because you you said it quite quickly, so people may not have grabbed it. So today, the services that you provide is project management. Um, okay, no? so this, yeah, close. So the the services that we provide is the we call it like the full scope um, team growth consulting program. Right. And that's, that includes way more than just Asana or processes within Asana. It includes, right. you know, like how to structure the team, how to set up processes properly, how to establish the culture in the organization, where to begin with this, how to develop talent, how to become better leaders, especially in what matters in small organizations. So this is like the whole consulting program that we do. The second thing is we focus only on processes. And that's where we involve Asana a lot. Because Asana is a tool that we use to, to build processes for startups. And the third service that we do is recruitment. Right. So we actually recruit. And I mean, our ideal customers are, um, are the people that we work with, are marketing agencies and e-commerce brands. We also have some SaaS companies, but primarily it's marketing agencies and e-commerce. Okay, just explain for the listeners what SaaS companies are. Well, it's a software as a service company, basically. Yes. Anyone selling you know, subscription to an app, a platform or something else that they created. Yeah. Yeah. So you you like companies that are working mm -hmm. with teams remotely, you know, yes. so 
like Buffer, you know Buffer, don't you? Mm -hmm. Like Buffer, they're they're like yeah. a social media distribution app, or they're a lot more now, I think. But people, their team is distributed all over the world in different time zones, mm -hmm. and they don't have an office anymore. Yeah, and they were very the very first original people that started doing that because I was a big fan of Buffer when I was scheduling all my social media posts, mm -hmm. uh, but I stopped because. I, in the end, I, I felt scheduling was a bit mm. inauthentic. I wanted to be more in the moment. Was, but apart yeah. from that, uh, I was wasting a lot of time with it. But apart from that, I think companies that are doing remote working, distributed teams in different places, mm -hmm. those are the kind of companies you like to work with. Yes, yes, exactly. I mean, I'm a big believer in remote. I'm a mm. big believer in hybrid working, if that makes sense. But I also know that um, you know if you want to build a really world world sorry it's hard to say world class team, you should not be limiting yourself to one location because you're missing out on a lot of great talent that's maybe in another country, maybe in another right. continent. So I'm a big believer that you can make it work if you have the right systems and the right processes in place. You can make yes. it work with any team. And I mean the company that I mentioned to you, the marketing agency that's in the US. We grew, like at its peak, it was 84 people and the, the team was fully remote and it was distributed around the globe. Wow. So it wasn't, so, I mean, that was even before COVID and that was not the usual thing. And yes. for us, for us, it worked. And, you know, we all got to appreciate um, the different time zones, having our own productivity, but also being aware of the times when we have to be online, all of us. It was like interesting experience and I believe in it. Like we did a great job with that agency. I'm not kidding. It's like one of the probably most well-known agencies of that size in, in the world. And it did a great yeah. PR as well. So, Okay, fantastic. Yeah. And are you still in touch with them? Um, Majority of them, yes. Yeah, great, mm -hmm. great. Oh, wonderful. And how many, how big is your team today, Erica? Yes, today we're about to bring the sixth person on the team. Great. Wow. Mm -hmm. And where are all your people based? Yes. So one person is in Lithuania. One person is going to be in Poland. Another person, no, actually another two people. Well, one is in the UK, well, England, and the other one is in Scotland. And one more potentially is going to come from somewhere else in Europe because we are just in a recruitment process. Fantastic. Yeah. Also remote, also international. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah. have you ever come across the, the term, um, you've got to eat your own dog food? No, but I have a dog and I wouldn't consider eating the dog. Food. No, no, but it's a term that um, somebody coined that if you're making, if you're a manufacturer making dog food, yeah. You know, if you really want to make sure that it tastes okay, you've got to eat it yourself, basically. But it's it's a it's a metaphor for saying mm. if you are promoting a particular service that other people should embrace and do, mm -hmm. you should be doing it first yourself. So mm. you can demonstrate to them, I'm a remote distrib I have a remote and distributed workforce as yeah. well. You know, so Mm. I'm doing it myself, so I'm very qualified to help you to do it. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And actually, we have a different saying. And the saying is, uh, the saying goes, um, the shoemaker without shoes. So if you don't practice what you preach, you're a shoemaker who doesn't wear shoes. With... Oh, brilliant. I love it. This is a Lithuanian one. We have it. <laughs> I like that one better, actually. <laughs> yeah. It's very straight to the point. Yes. Uh, yeah, the dog food one is a bit more cryptic, but the shoemaker without shoes is a really good one. Yeah. So yeah. what what are you hoping for will happen next for you? You know, what kind of direction are you going into? What's your dream? I mean, I'm going to stick to the vision that I have for the business. I just want to make sure that more people out there get a chance to enjoy the work that they do. Uh, mm -hmm. This is what I um, believe in. You know, we spend so much time at work and I'm I'm enjoying the work that I do. So I hope more and more people uh, can enjoy it too. And wherever the business goes, I'm just gonna, you know, in, 
I think by this, uh, by the end of this um, podcast, you already know that I'm always up for a challenge. I'm always up for a change. So I'm pretty sure, you know, there's a change coming soon. Uh, a big change is definitely the growth of the team that we are um, doing right now, which is mm. going well so far. And I just really want to see how that's going to turn out and how much it's going to allow us to expand further. Great. So are you, I mean, you mentioned something mm -hmm. earlier and you mentioned the word leadership mm -hmm. and um, you're quite young. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you've been a, you've been a CEO in a, in a growing company that grew very fast. So how do you help people with leadership? Um, leadership, yeah, leadership is not something that, you know, I would sit down and I would be like, okay, so now you as a leader, you have to do this, this and this. No, I think leadership comes actually from, um, you know, day-to-day -day problems that you face. I can always advise how to do it better, how to help people uh, grow in the positions they are. I all honestly don't think leadership comes with, um, with years of experience. Leadership actually comes from how open-minded you are and how you are able to listen to other people and know, you know, how to solve a problem that's arising um, without thinking about yourself first and think about what's maybe best for the business and for the person and for the role itself. So it's, it's, it's interesting because I know it's something that a lot of people think that you can only be a great leader if you've been leading teams for 20 plus years, but it's not really true. Leadership yeah. is something that it's a lot, a lot to do with how natural it is to you and how um, you're able to put yourself in other person's shoes and then also think about the business at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I agree. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's, that's a good answer because it's basically it's about attitude um, exactly. more than anything else. And, you know, they say, well, you know, great leaders aren't born, they're made and all of that kind of business but i mean how far away are you right now I, I i can't picture the map without looking but how far mm -hmm. away is lithuania from ukraine um actually it's a good question can it be 500 kilometers it can it could it's be close. Yeah. it's close it's very close you're mm -hmm. very very close yeah and we know that you know there is a leader in ukraine Mm, whatever anybody leader. might think whatever anybody might think of um but it's a, a he became leader a very mm. unlikely leader he was an actor i know mm -hmm. who would have thought an actor could become i know it's happened before in history you know like ronald reagan in the usa but yeah. in kind of you know in the Ukraine, I mean, no one could ever believe that something like that could happen. Yeah. And it wasn't until the war very sadly broke out that mm -hmm. all of a sudden we, the whole world, world came to see what leadership is really all about. Exactly. I agree. I mean, he's a, he's the best leader that I've seen as well. Um, and you know, this is, we all, we often speak about leading by example. But often we forget what it actually means. And, it, yeah. you know, leading by example means that you also have to do maybe even those things that you know are below your job description. And maybe you know you're overqualified. But just yes. taking that one thing to do that one action is going to inspire the team to do 10 more actions in advance. Yeah. It's yeah. just like it's it's leadership. That That's what I'm saying. I think you don't have to have 20 plus years of leadership experience to be a great leader. If you are a great no. leader... And if you're a people person, you're going to be a great leader, no matter how many years of experience you have. Yeah, yeah. Very and well also, said. Yeah, and also leaders don't have all the answers. Again, no matter how experienced they are. They yes. just figure it out and make it work if they didn't make it work from the first uh, round. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Wow, sounds amazing your your journey has been quite fast and you know i bet you kind of pinch yourself sometimes and go i'm so lucky that i've i've got achieved all this <laughs> right. um i don't say i'm lucky i'm very appreciative 
because right. I really appreciate what I have, but I know it's not luck. It's a hard work and lots of risks taken. Right. And I always say this to other people. You don't have to hope to be lucky or say that someone was lucky to achieve what they achieved. They at some point probably put their whole life on the line just to make it work because they truly believed in it. Um, yeah. But of course, and as I said, you know, I'm 100% appreciative of everything that I have, but I take every every single experience that I have as something that I can learn from or that I can be happy about. So for me, it's, you know, always like keeping that mindset that it's either a lesson or it's either a gain. So either way, I'm gaining because I'm either learning or I'm getting something out of it. Really well said. Yeah, 100% agree. There is no such thing as failure. No. Um, you're only ever growing, um, yeah. you know, growing in success or growing in learning. That's the only exactly. thing. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. That's my attitude. Brilliant. I love it. I love it. I mean, there is no doubt, Erica, mm -hmm. you are showing maturity well beyond your years. And actually, it's becoming more common because I have had uh, business owners that are younger mm -hmm. that are coming on the podcast more frequently now mm -hmm. than I've ever had. And, and it's really, really heartwarming to see. You know, I think it's mm -hmm. great. Uh, sometimes people give, you know, younger people a hard time. Yeah. Um, but I, it's, it's great that you're being successful and yeah, your hard work and dedication has yeah. achieved where you are. So well done you. Thank you. Thank so, you for kind of words. No, you're very, very welcome. Is, is there anything that I haven't asked, uh, so that you could cover it? Is, are there some other things you would like to share before we get to know how people get in touch with you? Mm, no, actually, I think we can go to that part because I really would love to speak with more business founders maybe with people who need advice or who want to just you know share their experience with me personally i would like to be able to connect with them brilliant That's, yeah mm -hmm. okay so let's share how they can get in touch with you so your website your socials what's the best way yeah so definitely feel free to reach out to me on linkedin and i can spell my name but it's going to be difficult i'm pretty sure you're going to have it in the description somewhere right Yes. Oh, um, yes. <laughs> yes. So you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, you can also follow our persona page. We also try to share loads of insights about, you know, how to make you feel better at work, how to maybe land a dream job of yours. Um, so also make sure to follow persona's um, LinkedIn page and also check our website, just the persona.com. Okay. So yeah. how do you pronounce and spell your surname? Because I would love to know how it's pronounced. It's Zegita. Zegita. Mm -hmm. okay. Erika Zegita. Zegita. Did you know, maybe you've already done this, but did you know you can record your name on LinkedIn? Did you do that already? No, I didn't, but I knew that I can do this. Yeah, yeah. You must do it because I I was going to pronounce it Zygite. Yep, this is how a lot of people pronounce it. <laughs> I mean, I was pretty sure you're going to pronounce it this way. <laughs> yeah, it's Zegita. Zegita. Okay, mm -hmm. fabulous. Uh, does it mean anything? No, actually, it doesn't mean anything. And I think it has German roots because uh, my ah. family comes from Germany, uh, like generations back. And this yes. is a German surname. Is it? Made Lithuanian. Ah. Made Lithuanian. It sounds now Lithuanian, but... Originally, it was in German. Okay, fantastic. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll make sure to put all of those details in the show notes so people can reach out to you on LinkedIn, uh, visit your website, and, and get in touch with you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Erica, I wish you all the best of success. I don't think you need it. I think mm -hmm. you will be really successful, continued success. And uh, I look forward to following your journey. Um, Thank you. And uh, good luck with finding that other person, the sixth person in your team. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you again for having me. It was a pleasure. And I look forward to connecting with uh, everyone who's listening. Brilliant. Take care. Bye for now. Bye bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests. So do get in touch, please.
you can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.